Looking deep into the cosmos, human beings have for centuries pondered the ultimate question, are we alone? Today, this question is gaining momentum. Now, the search for extraterrestrial life is going mainstream. Surveys like the Kepler mission are searching specifically for Earth-sized worlds that orbit their stars in regions called the habitable zone, where it's possible for liquid water to exist. If you can find the water, chances are you will find life. Hello and welcome to CU Science Update. I'm your host, Amy Moore Shipley. Astronomers have discovered about 500 planets circling other stars. Many are Jupiter-like, but too close to their parent star and too hot to support life. However, even here on Earth, scientists are finding microbes in extreme environments where it was once thought to be impossible for life. So if there is life out there, will we find some that are intelligent? Are there alien civilizations with technology capable of sending signals to other worlds? Or receiving ours? Finding these alien civilizations is the mission of the SETI Institute. The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, a private, nonprofit organization dedicated to scientific research, education, and public outreach. SETI was founded in 1984 and today employs over 150 scientists, educators, and support staff. Its senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, was recently invited to CU Boulder's 63rd Annual Conference on World Affairs. A radio astronomer, Seth now tries to eavesdrop on alien broadcasts. He has written hundreds of popular articles on astronomy, film, and technology, and co-authored a college textbook on astrobiology. Seth is also a frequent lecturer and has appeared in several television and radio shows, including co-host of the SETI Institute's weekly science radio show, Are We Alone? In 2009, he released his book, Confessions of an Alien Hunter, which takes on the sometimes admired and sometimes dismissed efforts to find extraterrestrial signals. This is Seth's second appearance on CU Science Update, and we are pleased to have him back. He meets with our correspondent, Rose Heafy. What we're listening for is not so much the aliens per se, but their equipment, if you will. We're listening for a transmitter. They don't know we're here because the only way they could be aware that there's some sort of technically sophisticated critter on this planet is via the, the television and the, and the radio signals we've been sending out. And we've only been doing that for half a century, so those signals are not terribly far out into space. If, if, if you grab the next 10 scientists off the streets here, bold or not, not a good idea. But if you were to do that and say, hey, do you think that there's a life out there? I think most of them would say there probably is. But we don't have any compelling evidence for life out there. Not yet. Not yet. I think within the next 10 or 20 years that'll change. But if you ask what's it like, you know, I suspect most of it is pretty stupid. You know, single-celled life. Because single-celled life can, you know, live in conditions that you wouldn't find comfortable. I hope that there's also intelligent life out there. But probably the dominant life form is stuff you need a microscope to see. Mm -hmm. And then Kind of with um, the microscopic findings, um, uh, NASA scientist Richard Hoover um, at the Marshall uh, Space Flight Center, he um, put out a couple papers where he was saying he found some fragments that um, on meteorites that showed that there were some uh, micro um, microscopic findings of some bacteria out there. Are these credible? Are these things that we should really be like looking into? What do you have, what are your feelings about those? The story, which is a fairly recent one, in which this guy he's a NASA scientist, uh, Richard Hoover. And he claimed that he opened up some special kinds of meteors. These are not your run-of-the-mill rocks from the sky. Now, this is a very special class of meteors that are known to be pieces of comets. Right? There are only like a dozen of these things known, in fact. He opens it up. He looks at them under a microscope, and he sees these little squiggly things. He says, you know what? Those look like bacteria we have here on Earth. Clearly, these are fossils of bacteria that were living in the comets where these meteors came from. Now, you might say, well, how does that affect me, the car buyer? if they find fossilized microbes in a, in a comet. Well, what's important about that is it tells you, gosh, you know, comets having life, that means that life may have gotten started in comets. Comets have a little bit of water. And maybe the Earth was just infected by comets a long time ago, and you're the descendant of some microorganism that got started in a comet. So your ancestral home is some rock in space. That would be very interesting if true. Uh, unfortunately, Hoover's claims are um, regarded very skeptically by the people who do this for a living. Now, could there be a possibility of like um, uh, us possibly uh, getting uh, our Earth contamination on it when he was finding it? Is that could be a possibility? Well, the explanation for what he did find, because if, if you read the paper that he published uh, in the Journal of Cosmology, which a, a lot of people attacked his results saying that this is not a very reputable journal. 
I, I don't think that's a fair thing to say. You don't judge the guy's paper on the basis of the fact that you don't like the journal, right? You, you judge it on the basis of the paper. But the paper had various lines of evidence that this, these really were microfossils. In particular, lots of pictures made with microscopes, right? And you look at these pictures, and sure enough, they're these squiggly things, and, and they look like microbes. But, you know, Rose, that's pretty cruddy evidence, actually, because, you know, you can look up in the sky and see, you know, your Aunt Harriet in the clouds. Like, God, it looks like my Aunt Harriet. But that, that's not very good proof that actually there are people in the clouds, mm -hmm. right? You look at a bunch of potatoes, you see faces, too. But, you know, it, that's very weak evidence. So just the fact that they look like microbes doesn't really mean very much. But he also has some chemical evidence. And that you can, you know, that's a little more quantitative. And that's the kind of evidence that's being criticized as being not very convincing. So the the jury it, maybe it's still out i don't think so the jury seems to have come in with a verdict that you should be very skeptical about this and you were kind of mentioning earlier about how possibility of uh comets kind of basically forming all the planets bringing uh <clears throat> basically microorganisms to other planets and that created life now is there a possibility that we could actually be the martians for example like for example there are um uh there was some uh, science that was saying that uh, there was uh, meteorites from from Mars and that uh, that planted all the life on Earth is that a possibility? That is a possibility. In fact, in fact, the biggest science news story of 1996 and that's a while now, but 1996 was a, a meteor that was picked up in Antarctica and inside there were also things that looked like fossils. Right. So this story is kind of a repetition of of that earlier story. Uh, again, people are very skeptical about that, but there's no doubt that if you had visited Mars four billion years ago, I, I, I doubt that you did, but if you had, you would find it a kinder, gentler world than it is today. It's a pretty terrible world. It's minus 50 degrees, even colder than Boulder. I mean, it's, it's very cold, a very thin atmosphere, no oxygen, this, that, and the other. There are a lot of reasons why it's very hard to live on the surface of Mars today. But four billion years ago, things were different. There was water on the surface of Mars. We don't know for how long, but there was liquid water, lakes, rivers, maybe even an ocean, a little unclear. Okay. And if you have liquid water and it sits there for a couple hundred million years, it might cook up some biology. Now, there are all these rocks slamming into Mars all the time, right? And some of those rocks, most of them, they, they go up, they kick up dirt that just falls right back to Mars. But some of it gets kicked out into space, and some of that, by chance, will hit the Earth. Turns out it's pretty easy to send a rock from Mars to the Earth, right? Much easier than the other way around. So it could be that life began on Mars, it infected the Earth via rock, and we're the descendants of those of that infection, so you are a Martian. I, I don't know if this entitles you to some <laughs> real estate on Mars, in which case you might have you know some financial benefit. So maybe women aren't from Venus. Maybe everyone's just from Mars. It could be that we're all from Mars. <laughs> That's right. See, men and women are not that different. <laughs> well, I bet some psychologists would probably beg to differ on that one. <laughs> but um, so basically, kind of you're kind of talking about Mars. What are the possibility of other candidates in our solar system for supporting life? Well, there are other candidates, actually. There are, in fact, a, a dozen others than Mars in our solar system, a dozen other places where there might be some liquid water. Um, one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, very well known, Europa, uh, you look at it through a telescope, and it just looks like a, you know, a big ice ball. It looks like a ping pong ball with cracks on it. It's covered with ice. But we're pretty confident that if you were to send Bruce Willis to Europa with a drilling rig and, and a bunch of rough guys and have them dig down, it would take about a 10-mile deep bore. Right, but then you would get through the ice and you'd hit this liquid ocean, which is an enormous ocean, much more water than is on the Earth. Right, it's been sitting there for four billion years, this liquid ocean. Now, it could just be sterile water, but after four billion years, maybe something's cooked up down there. So there could be some life there. There are two other moons of Jupiter, Callisto and Ganymede, that may also have these hidden oceans. The atmospheres of Venus, there's a fellow in Boulder, Colorado, who maintains that uh, that the atmosphere of Venus might have some sort of floating life. There's a moon of uh, Saturn. There are two moons of Saturn that might have life, Titan and Enceladus. Both of them show evidence for having liquids, and in the case of Enceladus, liquid water under the surface. Whenever you have liquid water, you can say, you know, you're getting some chemistry there. Maybe you're also getting life. So there are a lot of places nearby. Definitely. So, and also, <clears throat> possibly maybe outside the solar system, for example, the Kepler spacecraft just recently identified over a thousand potential, well, granted they are potential, but potential planetary candidates. So what are the possibility of possibly other galaxies? Yeah, well, uh, obviously, Kepler is looking at stars. Kepler is just a telescope that's staring at 150,000 stars for four years. Kind of a boring job, but it's only a telescope, so it doesn't complain. All right? And the idea is that it's looking for planets that cross in front of the stars and dim the light from the stars for a few hours. It's a very simple experiment. But it's already, as you say, found like 1,200 candidates. Actually, it's found a lot more now. A candidate 
star systems that may have planets. But the interesting thing is that about 50 of those candidates would be planets that are just the right distance from their star where you could have, you know, oceans on the surface. They, they wouldn't boil, they wouldn't freeze, they'd be liquid, okay? So th that's 50 planets that might have life, and you think, well, that's kind of nice, but in fact, Kepler's only looking at a tiny, tiny little fraction of the galaxy. If you crank up the numbers to say, well, if that's typical for the whole galaxy, how many cousins of Earth are in our galaxy? And the answer to that is about 500 million. That's the best number today. 500 million. That's a lot of cousins of Earth. It's hard to believe they're all sterile. And by the way, if you don't like our galaxy, if it doesn't meet your demanding standards for a galaxy, there, we can see 200 billion other galaxies, and they each probably have 500 million Earths. So there's a lot of real estate. <laughs> Now, you say there's a lot of real estate and possibly also the possibility of maybe tapping into resources, but how far away do you think are we actually from the actual space travel like you see in the movies like Star Wars and Star Trek? Yeah, well, <laughs> boldly go. I'd love to do it. Uh, I think a lot of people would love to do it, but it's really very hard. Uh, you know, our rockets go to like seven, eight miles a second. Right? That, that's, uh, I mean, that's great if you're going to Golden or something, but I mean, it's, it's not so good if you're going to the stars. To, to go to even near, nearby stars takes hundreds of thousands of years of experience. So clearly we can't do it. But you can say, well, we'll just build faster rockets, which is certainly true, we'll do that. But to really go to the stars, you need a rocket that can get there within, you know, 20 years or 50 years or something like that, not, not, not a million years. And the problem is that building a rocket like that takes an enormous amount of energy, uh, much, much beyond anything we can conceive of doing today. Will we never do it? Will we never be able to go to the, go to the stars? I mean, you know, one should never say never, but it's very, very hard, and uh, don't count on it, you know, soon. Oh, darn it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd already bought my tickets. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> see if you can get your money back. I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, say uh, we do find some life on these uh, uh, cousin planets, like you were saying, or even in our own solar system. What, do you, um, if they had time to evolve, and become intelligent beings, maybe create the broadcast and even get some um, feedback from them. What do you think they would look like? Would they be like the Vulcans and the avatars that we see in, in the media? Or what would, you, what would you think? What would you like them to look like? Well, it would be great if they looked like us, yeah. which they often do, and particularly in the films you name, right? An avatar, I mean, sure, she's got blue complexion, but you know, I mean, so what? Uh, most of those aliens, most of the aliens you see in the movies, right, are of the type that if they moved in next door, eventually you'd get around to inviting them over for dinner, right, because they don't look that different, right? <laughs> they don't look like a, I don't know, an adding machine or a pogo stick. I mean, they look, they look kind of like us, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, there's no reason to think that the real aliens would look anything like us. And in fact, if we were to actually find a signal coming from space, right, those guys have to be more technically advanced than we are because we're picking up their signals, not the other way around, right? So, you know, they're more advanced than we are, and probably they're thousands, millions of years more advanced, quite a bit. So what would they look like? Well, who knows? But what I do know is that once you invent radio, we invented radio maybe 100 years ago, within 50 years you invent computers, and maybe 100 years after that you invent thinking machines. So I think that the aliens probably went through that same trajectory of history. If they're more advanced than we are, I, I suspect they're most likely to be thinking machines, not soft, squishy guys with big eyeballs and no sense of humor. So when you say soft, like, uh, they're actually like machines, would you say they're more like HAL or like artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence. Now, if you're asking what do they look like, I mean, you know, what does a computer look like? Well, <laughs> you can put one on a laptop, you can put one on your desk, you can put one, I mean, you know, you can make it look like anything you want it to look like. Probably you don't spread it out too far because then it's harder for it to think. If you want it to think fast, you have to keep all the bits and pieces close together. But beyond that, I think they could look like anything you like. Anything I like. Hmm. Yes. Interesting. But, um, so what do you think we could accomplish by contacting them or receive or picking up a broadcast from them? What, what, what could we accomplish by doing that? Well, I think the, the first thing that you would accomplish is that you would know you're not the only kid on the block. And I think that's important. I mean, it wouldn't change your, your life. You wouldn't say, well, that's it. You know, I'm not the only kid on the block. I'm not going to school tomorrow. I mean, you wouldn't say that. You, you would still do whatever it is you're doing in life. Right? But on the other hand, something would have changed because you would recognize that Earth is it's special because humans are special, but so are aardvarks. And, and we're not, you know, <laughs> I mean, there's no other critter quite like an aardvark. So we're special in that sense, but we're not the only players on this stage. I think that, you know, from a philosophical point of view, that, that would be very interesting. The other possibility, I don't know how realistic it is to say this, but there, there is some possibility that you might understand something. 
if you could understand any of the message, then maybe they're going to tell you stuff that uh, otherwise would take you another 50,000 years to learn on your own. So, you know, that might be like giving uh, Neanderthals a, a key to the Library of Congress. Well, I don't think a Neanderthal would really know how to read, so that might be a little bit of... There, there's a, yeah, there's a problem there. You, know, you have to teach them how to read. <laughs> a, little bit of a little bit of a language gap, possibly. Te teach them what the hours are, too. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> but, um, so... Uh, when, with the way that SETI works, uh, that I send out radio broadcasts. Yeah, we, actually we don't broadcast. Oh, we we, we don't. just listen. Yeah, it mm -hmm. take, well, if you send one out, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might be a hundred thousand years before you get a response. Better to. But there was a there was one uh, time when you sent out about three minutes, I believe. We the, various messages have been mm -hmm. sent. It's true, mostly as demos. But anyhow. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, it'd be very difficult for an alien to the timing for that one message, but other to find that one specific message. Mm -hmm. Now, what? Are there other ways that we can use to, to find other intelligent life? Like, for example, like looking at planetary compositions. Are there other ways that studies like looking into that? Or? Sure, there are lots of other ways to find life. If you're happy with life that might not be very intelligent, for mm -hmm. example, you could look at the, uh, the, the atmospheres of some of these planets around other stars. And the way you do that is you use what's called a spectroscope. But it's essentially just looking at the colors of the light being reflected off those planets. If you could do that, and you could do that if you built the right telescope. You might see, for example, oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, there's oxygen in this atmosphere, right? 20% or something of the air in this room is oxygen. Why is that? Oxygen, actually, two billion years ago, there was very little oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. What's done that is photosynthesis. So thanks to the plants, right, we had this oxygen, which is beneficial for us. If you found oxygen in somebody else's atmosphere, you might say, well, I don't know if there's anything there that's very clever, but they've got plants. Right? So you could find life, for example, that way. There are, other, there are other schemes you could use. Definitely. Now, so you've kind of said, you know, uh, we haven't really found pond scum. We haven't found dead pond scum. But, I mean, what motivates you to continue searching? I mean, there's got to be a lot of naysayers out there. What can, can motivates you to continue doing your work? Well, you know, it's just a very interesting question. That uh, it's, it's, it's not a new question, you know, is there life in space? I mean, people have been, I'm sure the cavemen were asking that question too. But, you know, we, we finally have the right kind of instruments and we know enough about astronomy and something about biology. So now we at least there's some chance we could answer the question. I mean, you can never prove that there's no life out there. There's nothing you can do to prove that. But there is some chance you could prove that there is life out there. So it seems sort of crazy if you have the capability of looking not to look. And for me personally, I just like working on a, on a topic that's sort of a big picture topic. I mean, I, I could be a tax attorney, I suppose, and, you know, and, and I'm sure it'd be more lucrative. <laughs> but, but, you know, but this is a big picture question, and there's, there's a certain degree of excitement in doing that. And plus, you get to be an advisor on movies like Contact. So. I, I do advise on movies, yes, but most of them are cheesy sci-fi films. <laughs> yes. Well, not, not Contact so much, but... Uh, Others, yeah. Well, yeah. at least at least you have those opportunities. But yeah. it sounds like you really look like to, like what you're doing, and it sounds great. And I really hope maybe you can find some find some aliens, and hopefully when you have that breakthrough moment, you'll let's see you update no, and we can be the first to break that news. Well, I got to tell you, <laughs> I would love to do that. I have to say there has been a few false alarms. And, you know, you completely forget all those people you promised you were going to update <laughs> first. Your first thought is, I have a lunch plan for tomorrow. That's your first thought. Definitely. Always thinking with the stomach. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having us, uh, coming on the show, and uh, good luck with the rest of your research. Thank you very much, Ruth. Shortly after this interview, operations at SETI's Allen Telescope Array were suspended due to lack of funding. Located in Mountain View, California, this field of 42 radio telescopes searched the skies for signs of extraterrestrial life, working with the University of California Berkeley's Radio Astronomy Lab. Since it became fully functional in 2007, the ATA worked 24 hours a day, but now reduced federal dollars and a state budget crisis have put the array into a temporary form of hibernation. SETI is now searching for donations to keep it running, but fortunately, the ATA will resume operations in 2013 when a new round of funding goes into effect. As a nonprofit organization, SETI is not possible without public support. If you wish to donate, go to their website at www.seti.org and click on Team SETI, where you can become part of a growing community of supporters who are making the search for extraterrestrial life possible. That's all for this edition of CU Science Update. We'd like to thank Seth Shostak for joining us today. There will be more shows to follow with other guests from the Conference on World Affairs, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you can watch other CU Science Update episodes on iTunes or visit our website at cuscienceupdate.com. And don't forget to like us on our Facebook page. 
Until next time, keep looking up.